Hello and welcome to the Haxton Knits channel. My name's Deanna and I am an American living in Okinawa, Japan. This week we continue our discussion of traditional knitting styles by exploring a little bit about the Bohas knitting style coming from Sweden. And I'll give you a little bit of an update on what I've been knitting on this week. Really, this is going to be a short episode and I hope you enjoy. Let's get started. <laughs> Continuing our discussion on traditional knits this week, we find ourselves on the west coast of Sweden. The year is 1939 and the people of the region of Bohuslän are experiencing a bit of a problem. You see, this region's primary industry comes from the quarries, from the stone cutters. And the cumulative effects of the depression and the rise of the use of asphalt means that no longer is there a great demand for the cut paving stones that were previously in use. This prompted the women of Bohuslän to approach this woman, Emma Jacobson. She's the governor's wife and would soon give birth to a cottage industry that became known the world over. We're talking about Bohus knitting. Guys, I have to admit, the goth teenager in me cannot say the word bohas and not think the word Bauhaus. So just to be clear here, we are in fact talking about the knitting industry that was in existence from 1939 to 1969 in the Bohuslän region of Sweden and not the band that launched gothic music as we know it today just so we're on the same page. This week's tradition is actually the first of the knitting traditions I'm covering where I don't have a sample of my own work to share with you. I have never knit a boha sweater, but I admit that before researching this topic, I could close my eyes and I could picture a boha sweater. These are yoked sweaters with stranded color work. And in my mind, they're always just a little bit fuzzy. They're not crisp or sharp, they're not like, they're not like the sweater I'm wearing today with very uh, sharp, clear, defined patterns that are easy to look at. They're always just a little bit vague, maybe a little bit artistic. So what is the Bohas style of knitting? This style of knitting, like I said, the people of Bohuslän, the women in that region, came to Emma Jacobson. She was a art historian, a bit of an artist, and working together, they threw around the idea of various crafts and finally settled on knitting. There actually wasn't a great big knitting tradition in this region already. So a lot of the artists, a lot of the crafters that became part of this industry had to be taught how to knit. There were organized classes. Women would leave for a couple of weeks at a time and go and learn how to knit. And that is incredible to me because I look at some of the Bohas patterns and you have to realize these are stranded color work with fuzzy yarns, there's pearls involved, there's more than two colors at once involved. So the idea of taking a person who has never knit and trying to get them to be productive in money-making, knitting these particular styles just kind of blows my mind. But what you have to know is that the Bohas knitting industry did not start with the Bohas sweater as we know it today. Instead, it started with simple gloves, simple socks, knit out of coarse wool. And then it became this thing. It was a real statement of a woman's style and prestige to own a boha sweater. And that is pretty phenomenal for a cottage knitting industry. Really, I can only think of one other sweater, one other cottage knitting industry that reached that same level of fame. And that is of course the Fair Isle knitting donned by royalty and known the whole world over. 
but so was Bohus Knitting, donned by royalty and known the whole world over. Whenever I talk about a traditional style of knitting, I like to talk about the things that make it distinct. And there are a few things that are very distinct in the Boha style. Number one is the yarn. They were all using the same yarn. And so if you're knitting a piece of Boha knitting or Boha inspired knitting, you need to be knitting with a very similar type of yarn. And this yarn was a very fine yarn, lace weight perhaps, and generally was a wool and angora blend. And that's what really gives that sort of fuzzy appearance that I think of when I think of a bohus pattern. It's that floof, the fluff of the angora rabbits coming through. But one of the other things that really uh, sort of blurs the image and makes bohus knitting kind of soft looking is the use of the purl stitch. Really, there aren't that many other traditions where you see stranded color work incorporating purl stitch in such a way. You can see an example of this in um, perhaps the big lace pattern. Um, I'll put some pictures up, but you can see the purl stitch in some of these patterns a little bit more. They use it as, um, as part of the pattern to really draw your eye to this raised little nub that is the purl stitch. It actually took me a really long time to get around to recording this video, and there's a reason for that. I've been feeling a little conflicted about my channel. I've been feeling a little bit um, uncertain. You see, there are so many YouTubers out there, and this particular style has been covered really, really well in the past. And so I definitely want to take a moment to push out, uh, send you all out into the other channels of the YouTube universe to check out some astounding videos. In fact, I'll put a playlist in right here <laughs> and I'll see if I can uh, link all of those particular videos to you, um, especially because I don't have the knitting here to hold and touch and show to you. And there, and there are some great videos out there where you can really see some of these patterns. And it's interesting, um, now even though the Boha style of knitting stopped as a cottage industry in 1969, it has been continued with approved, like officially approved um, vendors who sell the yarn in the original colors, so dyed to the original colors and can sell kits and patterns with the original patterns. And if you're looking for some of the original patterns, they were actually distributed among the cottage industry on these interesting little cards. So they would have sort of a card with a graphed out section of pattern, a repeat of pattern, and little bitty samples of the yarns that you should use for each section tied to the side. And then you would have to be a person in the know to interpret how to use that card. So you would have to already um, be part of this industry and have been taught how to knit the sweaters in the style and then just apply the pattern card to that style. But now you can still find the original patterns. There is a lovely book out there, it's called Poems of Color, where a lot of the original patterns have been painstakingly reproduced. Uh, this is an instance where my geographic location has actually kind of hindered me because I really wanted to get that book to me here to look at and explore and knit before talking to all of you. But unfortunately, the way shipping is going in the world, it just wasn't possible. So I'm hoping that some of you out there will be able to get your hands on this particular book, maybe before I do. Uh, check your local libraries. I did see for sale, um, in fact, I have ordered it, it's coming. I have a former library book that was a used book that is coming to me. So I'm very excited about that. I think that perhaps uh, once that book arrives, I may go buy some yarn to knit one of those because come on, I can't, I can't talk about it if I've never knit any of it, right? So if you are looking for official kits for Bohas knitting, you can go over to the Angora Garnet website and I'll put that link down below. Um, the woman there, I'm not gonna attempt her name, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I'd rather not butcher anybody's name if I don't have to, um, is actually raising Angora rabbits and she um, sells yarn that is dyed in the official 
boha style and has kits and has tons and tons of sweaters in her shop so you can see them um christy glass actually did an interview with her and i didn't know who she was when i when i saw the interview the first time so it was interesting to kind of learn this history and then go back and watch that interview again with some fresh eyes there are several patterns of the boha style that i have been dying to knit especially that big lace pattern i mentioned before oh gosh and this one pattern it's a black sweater with just sunset inspired blocks of color so pretty i'll put the pictures in i am actually really excited to eventually cast this on um, of course that will be after i finish my orenberg lace shawl which at this rate is going to take a very very long time oh, gosh this feels like a very short discussion on bohas knitting and i apologize for that I think uh, once I get my book and get my knitting going again, perhaps, perhaps we'll revisit this particular one, but I hope you appreciate just a short little primer into this, and as always, I'm going to put lots of links to other places down below, and I'll try to link to those particular YouTube videos in my playlists, and I hope you appreciate that. Let's just, um, you know, check in for a minute. My knitting this week has been very exclusive. So last time I showed you this bad boy, everything fit neatly into this bag. This bag, of course, is from the Silver Shed, and I purchased that one, oh, at one of the knitting festivals many years ago. I didn't show you guys this last time, but this bag, oh my gosh. So the outside is knitting, but the inside is actually like the wrong side of knitting too. And that was what totally sold me on it because I already had a bag similar to this, a Mrs. Brown bag. But how can you resist that? Okay, here it is. Mosaic blanket, Circa Vogue knitting, what, I think it was probably a 2014. Oh, look how much I've gotten done. Aren't you excited? As I mentioned before, this bad boy is a present for a friend of mine, so I have been almost exclusively knitting on this, which means I don't have any other knitting projects to show you, which means this gets to be a very short episode. <laughs> uh, this bad boy is knit out of... I don't know. I don't know what it's knit out of. Okay, hold on. This bad boy is knit out of Valley Yarns. This is Haydenville Bulky. I know I've mentioned before, but I really love Valley Yarns. They are very affordable and they are very nice quality. And I am knitting in the color blue and the color silver. And I have gone through so many skeins of yarn. Oh my gosh, could Bulky Yarn go so far? I think I have like 14 balls of each of these, but I am almost done. And I am so excited to get this off my needles because the heat is coming in in Okinawa and having a blanket in your lap all day is just no fun at all. I really want to cast on a tank top or, I don't know, a bikini? Just something that's not going to be hot. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this thing looks so good on camera. I have to admit that when you're knitting it or when you're kind of sitting with it close to you, you lose the pattern. You don't see it as well, but man, does this thing look nice on camera. Ah! And it's so easy, guys. If you, um, I love mosaic knitting. Like, I love it to death. The charts, they're usually pretty simple and repeatable, and then, of course, the wrong side rows are an exact repeat of the right side row, so you can just mindlessly follow along. Mosaic knitting is my favorite. Don't tell stranded color work but I have a new love and it is mosaic knitting or actually let's be proper. All right. All right. Master knitters. It's slip stitch knitting because not all slip stitch patterns are mosaic patterns. And if you can tell me why, what's the difference between a slip stitch pattern and a mosaic pattern, you get a cookie. For life in Okinawa this week, it's been a very relaxed week. The summer heat has really turned itself on, which means that going outside has been less than exciting. Uh, we have had a couple of trips to the beach, a little bit of snorkeling, uh, but we did do a little bit of going out to eat. How many of you out there know what a shabu shabu restaurant is? 
Mm. Oh, so good. So much food. Oh, so there's a, <laughs> there's several different types of restaurants in Japan that I really enjoy going to. The yakiniku and the yakitori places and like hibachi. You know, you guys know about hibachi. Um, but shabu shabu. Shabu shabu is along the same lines of uh, yakiniku where you're cooking your own food yourself at your table. But instead of cooking over a grill or coals or fire or whatever they're using, this is a hot pot. So you have a big giant bowl of boiling hot broth. Maybe not boiling hot, but nice and really, really, really hot. Yeah, boiling hot broth. And then you get kind of all you can eat, depending on the place or a la carte, you order ingredients that you get to throw into this pot. And the reason it's called shabu shabu is it's the noise that the meat makes as it cooks. So the, it's so hot that when you put the meat in, it like sizzles and you, you swish it around and it goes shabu, 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 shabu. <laughs> At least that's what I've heard. Uh, so we went to a local shabu shabu restaurant. It's a chain that's in our neighborhood and got just a giant pot of deliciousness. My husband goes for all the meats and I go for all the veggies and tofu. And in the end, you have this big flavorful broth. Um, you can eat the meat as you go. And then when you're ready, drink all the broth as soup and eat all of those yummy, yummy vegetables that have been flavoring the soup the whole time you cook my favorite place. I'm pretty sure we're going to go there tomorrow too, because it's been a year since we've been allowed to go out and now we can. And Shabu Shabu has been calling to me. And that's really all I have for life in Okinawa. This is going to be a nice short episode today. I did, um, as you can probably see, rearrange a little bit in here. So uh, up there over my shoulder is this gorgeous sort of um, pseudo woven. So it's actually crocheted, but it's like a crocheted sheet hung between two pieces of driftwood to make it kind of look like a piece of weaving with an adorable crocheted sheep on it. I have shown this on the channel before, but this comes from a local crafter. She goes by Zaurik Knit Knit, and she has a little shop that is nearby called Teleforge. So you should check her out. I'll put a link below to her website. It is all in Japanese. So, you know, just um, throw on your Google Translate. You'll be fine. That's how I get around. And then up here over my shoulder, uh, I thought it was pretty, looks like a piece of artwork, but this is actually the packaging from the local coffee roaster that I use here. This is Poto Hodo, and they just, everything came in this really beautifully wrapped package with these nice like stamped pictures of coffee, and I love coffee. So got, you know, a little bit of rearranging. Behind me as always is a picture frame that is just a hodgepodge of swatches, a lot of them from my Master Knitter program. I hope you guys like the new setup and I've been working on my sound, so hopefully sound and lighting are getting a little bit better every episode. All right guys, that's actually everything for today. I know it's a short episode, it's a little bit brief, but I've been experimenting with a little bit more sound and lighting. So hopefully everything is looking a little more professional this week. And I look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>